On the Zaporizhzhia Oblast front, the Ukrainians launched a small infantry assault to test the advanced enemy defenses. They take these foxholes easily and organize an outpost in the invaders' first line of defense. Several hours pass and the Ukrainians are suddenly saturated by several artillery barrages. The brutality does not cease and from afar they can hear the sound of machines roaring. Despite the distance, Ukrainian soldiers can distinguish various Russian vehicles and infantry. Even so, they cannot recognize what type of tanks are approaching. Equipped with their MG3S, the Ukrainians keep the enemy infantry at bay. However, distant shots from a Russian tank are forcing them to take cover. Picking up a Javelin missile, a Ukrainian launcher can distinguish, thanks to the target monitor, that this Russian vehicle is totally different from what it has seen before. Once the target is captured, the Javelin missile flies about two kilometers toward its prey. Constant pressure along all defensive positions has drained Russian resources considerably. Defense in depth and especially mine infested areas have been able to slow down the Ukrainian thrust. Still, the balance is tilting slightly toward Ukraine. The sanctions have hit the Russian state hard and its war output is not at the levels needed to make up for casualties. In desperation, the general staff decides to turn to an old friend from the past. With more than 80 years of history on its shoulders, the T-34 is chosen to re-enter the battlefield. A tough debate begins among engineers to find out what is the procedure to contemporize this old age device. It may seem like this scenario is a complete prank at first. Long before the invasion of Ukraine, the T-54, which entered service in 1948, was part of several modernization phases. In 2009, through collaboration between Peruvian and Ukrainian industry, Typhoon 2A was born. This model breathed new life into the T-54 with a new cannon, anti-tank missiles, ballistic computers, thermal vision, better armor, and a handling system. The M55S is another upgrade endeavor taking a similar route to the example mentioned above. These projects began with the purpose of finding alternatives for countries that could not afford modern tanks. The T-54 with its massive production numbers lent itself to this purpose. Nor should we look at other models or scenarios. The T-34-100 was an alternative version of the iconic tank, incorporating an LB-1 cannon, new turrets and transmissions. The project after constant updates was at the point of being mass-produced, but the Soviet Union decided on the T-54 instead. Now, starting T-34's modernization for the new Millennium Battlefield. As always, the new cannon will be the protagonist. A smoothbore 125 immediately KBM 1M cannon is the choice I have in mind. This weapon is the same one used in the T-72 series. To remember previous points, it is possible to install a higher caliber cannon on the TDT-34. We not only have the example of the Soviet T-34-100, but also the Egyptian T-34 operating a heavy artillery cannon. The requisite would be to create a new steel turret with larger dimensions. There is a need for a larger space to withstand the new cannon's recoil. Much more effective in terms of space use is the automatic loader with ammunition based on a conveyor belt. The best known carriers of belt laying machines are the American German MBT-70 tank, the French Leclerc and the Japanese Type 90. This concept provides the placement of stacking ammunition in the developed aft niche of the tower. Instead of traditional shelving, there is a mobile conveyor belt with cartridges for casings. At the command of the crew, the transporter must bring the projectile of the desired type to the feed window, after which the distillation mechanism pushes it into the combat compartment and sends it to the chamber. We have the example of T-72-120. In order to be able to use 120 men in enemy NATO standard fixed ammunition, the automatic loader of the gun is installed in an isolated self-contained compartment in the turret bustle. This version of the T-72 did not pass the development phases. 
In terms of mobility, let's enter the many additions required to make the T-34 battle ready. Firstly, adding rubber tracks helps to reduce fuel consumption and suits perfectly a medium's tank weight. There is only one company that manufactures these tracks. Lately, armor vehicles have been increasing their load, so rubber has been discarded for more durable materials like steel. V2 diesel engine might be here to stay. This motor it's the same version implemented on the old T-34. Furthermore, an updated version of the V2 can be found on the T-72 and T-90. Our modification is implementing a new V2 engine, like the one on the T-90, inside the modern T-34-125. The jump in mobility is apparent because there will be a capacity increase to about 1130 horsepower. For now, all the modifications have caused our tank to acquire weight. We need new suspensions, if don't want a new Tiger II or Elephant situation. Why venture into unknown territory when we have a proven example? Using the same suspension from the Peruvian Typhoon tank, we cut unnecessary risk by implementing trustworthy suspensions. At first, we were thinking about the possibility of adding an active protection system. An option was the Israeli trophy system. The premise is throwing a small number of explosively formed projectiles to destroy incoming threats before they hit the vehicle. However, the interior space in the tank is running short. Besides, the T-34-125 doesn't have the energy capacity to enforce this system. We might have to stick with laser alert. It detects analyzes and locates directions of laser emissions from laser guidance systems and laser rangefinders. Then it warns the crew and can start various countermeasures like a smoke screen, aerosol screen or a jammer. As for tangible protection, once again we are applying the same features as the Peruvian Typhoon. T-34's armor is obviously thinner than T-55 AES. We are trading with the risk that overwhelming reactive armor may penetrate our tank's thin steel plates. The T-3485 has 90 millimeters on the front, and that's a low value for modern combat. A way to counter this vulnerability is putting the Nij reactive armor. As with all ERA modules, they are designed to explode when impacted by a weapon. NIS modules differ from other ERA modules in that they are specifically designed to eliminate or minimize damage to adjacent modules, thus allowing for a 200% to 300% boosted effectiveness against multiple weapon impacts compared to other ERA module configurations. It would be effective against depleted uranium sabots because it scatters a few iron plates, which literally cut the incoming shell. The downside is the added weight. The increase in tonnage is considerably the same as the acquisition price. Emerging among the branches of a small forest, a T-34 fires several bursts at a long reach. In a unique but not unprecedented industrial effort, the Russian general staff mobilized its resources to rehabilitate the T-34. Transforming this vestige for modern combat may seem like a simple joke, but there is still room for this vehicle to perform acceptably. This process basically means the complete restructuring of the tank. Leaving these modifications aside, we will still be able to distinguish those characteristics of the Soviet Union's workhorse. We cannot forget that no matter how much they add innovations, it is mandatory not to forget the role of the T-34. Diverting it or giving you improper responsibilities will result in the destruction of such weapons. It would be prohibitive to put the T-34-125 in direct combat with other tanks. But if it is used as support to the infantry, still the old T-34 will be able to continue writing a few last pages in its combat history.